Uh, I would like to take just a moment to welcome you to this, uh, it's not quite an annual, but every other year Sun and Star uh, conference, uh, which most of you in the room I think know deals with Japan and East Asia. And uh, I did actually bring my eight o'clock class with me this morning. My name is uh, Jim Hollifield. I'm a professor here and director of the Tower Center. And again, I want to welcome everyone here. Um, for those of you who were at dinner last night, um, the dean of the Maxwell School, uh, Jim Steinberg, kicked off the, uh, uh, the program. And he led us into what I would simply call the great game that's happening in Asia. Uh, it's a part of the world which still has a balance of power logic to it. Uh, and for better or ill, the United States is very much a part of this game. We're going to continue that discussion this morning. I mentioned the Sun and Star Fund. I know we have a lot of Japanese friends and colleagues here. Uh, this fund was created uh, in the late 1990s. Uh, to promote the study of Japan uh, in Dallas-Fort Worth, and we're grateful to those who set this fund up, uh, specifically the Hitachi Corporation. Uh, I also want to point out that this is an event that is being sponsored under the umbrella of Dedman College uh, of Humanities and Sciences. Um, where, and you can see we're sitting here in this fabulous facility in the Cox School of Business, so I think this will make you think about how interdisciplinary SMU is, the connections that exist between the colleges and schools. Uh, so we are extremely fortunate uh, to be able to partner with the Cox School. I'm not sure who's here representing Cox, but we will, uh, we will repeat this again at lunch today. And I'm sure there are a lot of business students uh, in the class as well, in the class, excuse me, uh, in the audience. Um, and we have a very unusual opening today, um, unusual in several ways. First of all, I think it's going to be largely a panel of historians, I believe. Uh, so as one of my Greek colleagues once said to me, history, history is the mother of us all. So it is, and I'm a failed historian, by the way. You know, I always wanted to be historian so I can sit here and admire uh, those who actually succeeded in becoming historians. Uh, and it's also unusual because the, the dean of our college, uh, William Tsutsui, who is sitting up here in front on the right, who will be introduced shortly, uh, is on the panel. Uh, I don't know if you know how unusual it is <laughs> to actually have a dean uh, take time out and come and do something like this. But given the trials and tribulations of a dean, I suspect this is a tremendous <laughs> break and a tremendous interlude. He gets to go back to what I know him well is his first love, uh, which is history uh, and teaching. Um, and we also have a, uh, a bit of a continuation from last night. Um, Secretary Steinberg, Dean Steinberg, really was the quintessential dip diplomat laying out the great game for us, the players trying hard to understand what is the position of the Chinese uh, and the Japanese and the Filipinos, the Vietnamese and others who are involved in these disputes, in uh, uh, maritime disputes. Um, but we had sitting with him um, our own senior fellow uh, who uh, commanded the Pacific Fleet, uh, Admiral Patrick Walsh, uh, who is going to kick off this morning's event and talk about the great game. Uh, the great game looks very different if you're sitting uh, on the bridge of, a, uh, of an aircraft carrier commanding the Seventh Fleet. So he is acutely tuned to the tactical issues, uh, but not only to tactics. Uh, he has a PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy in international law, international relations. So he's also acutely aware of the great strategic issues that are at stake here. Uh, and we're very, very pleased to have um, uh, Admiral uh, Walsh um, as a senior fellow here in the Tower Center and the co-director 
of our national security program. And Pat, I can't resist my favorite line of the past several years when the Admiral retired and came here. He's from Dallas, came back here, I should say, and he said it was a really difficult adjustment uh, going from the Pacific to Bachman Lake. So let's, let's now welcome Admiral Walsh to the podium. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Jim, for that introduction. I'm honored to join such an eclectic group of academic experts, of uh, some policymakers and national representatives. I congratulate the organizers of this symposium for the foresight and the wisdom to pick such an impactful, timely, and relevant theme. In Asia contested waters, East China Sea and the South China Sea, you will have a seat ringside among those who have worked, studied, and tried to resolve some of the most difficult, complex issues of our time as we try and bring about constructive, cooperative, and concrete solutions, bring them forward and make them apply in the maritime domain. The address last evening by Secretary Steinberg helped to set the strategic framework for the discussions to baseline our understanding of challenges that we have today and inform us as we identify the steps necessary to move forward in maritime security and stability. So our task today is to address the essential questions. What have the historical claims to these islands been and how does this issue become so contested over time? Do the islands matter for the oil, gas, minerals, and fish around them, and then for the power struggles and primacy in the region that it generates? What are the strategic interests of the United States in these disputes, and what should the United States foreign policy look like given the political issues surrounding these various claims? And finally, given the rise of China, how do conflicts over contested waters in the East China Sea and the South China Sea influence U.S. strategic interests in the region. As if we needed another reminder of how important the topic is to stability in the region and to the international community, yesterday, Foreign Policy published The Drone Wars Come to Asia, How China Sparked an Unmanned Arms Race. Sean Brimley, Ben Fitzgerald, and Eli Ratner were the authors. And they remind us, quote, it has been one year just one year since Japan's previous ruling liberal government purchased three of the Senkaku Islands to prevent a nationalist and provocative Tokyo mayor from doing so himself. The move was designed to dodge a potential crisis with China, which claims indisputable sovereignty over the islands. Think about that. What a study in crisis management and decision making. A year ago, in a move to try and detention the problem, look at where we are today. Look how quickly this dispute has moved along in a short period of time. And I ask you to remember also just how quickly a collision between a fishing vessel from China and the Japanese Coast Guard quickly escalated into something much larger than just a simple local issue. I'm telling you, we have to focus on this. As far away as it is, and as isolated an incident, these separate sort of uh, events appear to be. Watch how quickly escalation moves along and then ask yourself why. Why do things that ought to be handled so locally and taken care of at a very local, regional level become not only national but international in scope? So national interests are not neatly defined or defined by simple geographic boundaries. And when you compare the world of 1946, consisting of 51 countries, to the number of countries today, 194 with the addition of South Sudan, 197 if you count Vatican City, Tibet, and Taiwan, it highlights the sometimes overlooked but powerful impact in the Pacific region of ancient civilizations, independent movements, nationalism, and expressions of cultural identity. Each can pull on a nationalistic heartstring and fuel tension, even in an era of economic interdependence, 
interconnectedness, prosperity, and stability, where it's seen that so many scores from previous conflicts have been dormant or already settled. Our span of interest for the panels today and their discussions is not only vast, but it's diverse and complex in its own right. China is not monolithic. It doesn't speak with one voice. That's why we're so in tune with the actions that China takes, because we know who has the dominant role in speaking on behalf of China. It's an area, the Pacific, is an area where geography can facilitate or hinder the movement of people, commerce, and resources. History influences national values, grievances, and fuels sovereign passions. Culture and religious values extend influence well beyond the national horizons depicted by coordinates on a chart. All these factors are in play in the maritime domain, which serves as the essential conduit that powers a global economic system and enables 90% of the world's trade. In real terms, the East China Sea, the South China Sea is at the center. They're at the center of lines of communication in the Asia Pacific region, a region which comprises one half of the Earth's surface, 15 time zones, home to the largest economies in the world, influenced by the world's six largest military forces, half of the world's population, in an era, area evolving with political and economic ties, as well as increasing demand for resources, raw materials, and rapid military, especially naval, modernization. Competing national interests, regional and international disputes, where countries develop their own strategic partnerships. So no matter what advancements futurists predict on the horizon, the movement of energy and goods and the bulk of the world market is going to continue to move by sea, and often through areas of vulnerability and instability. And that is why the theme for this conference is so important. So it's no surprise that in Asia Pacific today, maritime considerations influence national security planning, economic exchange, and societal development more than any other location or aspect of the global environment. Here, the maritime narrative influences the largest populations, economies, and militaries. So nations that desire the capability to protect their economic interests, ensure stability, and secure key lines of approach to their future need maritime capability. As a result, decisions made about maritime forces directly impact the protection representation and ability of a nation to defend its sovereign interest at sea. In this region, sea power has returned to preeminence as an essential element of national power. The Pacific century, this century, sea power resumes its traditional role in the sea lines of communication as an instrument of peace, stability, and protector of trade and development. For the U.S. government, investments in the Navy, as well as reductions contemplated in procurement, readiness, operations, and manpower, while other governments invest in their own maritime forces, have direct and predictable consequences that call into question the ability of the United States to remain engaged in the region, to defend its interests and those of its partners. I am not aware of any country in the region that's reducing the size or capability of its Navy. Additionally, long-standing partners, friends, and allies in the region desire more naval presence rather than less because, because of concerns over tension and the potential for conflict. In this context, the People's Republic of China drives any discussion about state interest and national security, both regionally as well as globally. China has moved beyond a continental defense strategy, and her leaders are convinced that to, to defend China it is necessary to push foreign militaries out of its near seas to the first island chain to include the Yellow Sea, the East Sea, and the South China Sea areas. This near sea defense strategy attempts to influence and to whatever extent possible control all foreign military operations in adjacent areas, extending even to, and in some cases, the territorial seas of its neighbors. I have been called on guard by the Chinese Navy on several occasions for violations of Chinese space at sea with warnings of terrible consequences unless I move my ship along away from the Chinese coastline. 
That was 75 miles off the coast of Japan when I received that call. This strategy, the strategy of the Chinese Navy, attempts to redefine the taxonomy, the understanding, and the use of the high seas in terms wholly unfamiliar to a region that is home to three of the four world's largest economies, 10 of the world's fastest growing economies, and one third of the global trade in transit. Today, maritime highways network and connect a regional economic juggernaut made possible by security and stability for the past six decades. To accede to the narrowly selective Chinese historic interpretation and expansive geographic claim in the South China Sea effectively makes 1,600 nautical miles of water that conforms to the shape of the extended southern Chinese coastline subject to internal Chinese law with sovereign territorial rights attendant to it, which is unequivocally counter to the most specific, unimpeachable axiom of the maritime commons envisioned and practiced by nations for centuries in the form of customary international law. As China has developed the technology, equipment, and confidence to execute this strategy, it has taken actions viewed and characterized by Japan and by ASEAN nations as overreach, a term used to describe intimidating, aggressive behavior well beyond acceptable norms and generated the complete loss of a tremendous amount of goodwill. Assertive and expansive maritime territorial claims have touched off and unleashed a potentially volatile resurgence of nationalism, historic boundary disputes, and challenged access to resources in contested economic exclusion zones that fuel tension in the region. We are witnessing the PLA growing rapidly in technical capability and industrial capacity, symbiotic with increasing fervor and rhetoric. We see evidence that technical military advancements have provided fertile ground for diplomatic initiatives that challenge the U.S. government positions on resource exploration, maritime boundaries, and other coercive ways that do not conform to international law. They're antithetical to regional stability and test globally accepted democratic principles at a time when the national mood for the United States, as well as Japan, has been the need to focus on domestic issues. In looking at this region over the coming decades, Relatively few topics have the potential to determine substantial political, economic, and military outcomes for such a large area in the community of nations as one, the PRC expansion of military influence, two, the PRC near sea defensive construct, three, the PLA role in China's internal and external policy making process, four, the US posture, presence, and influence in the region, and finally, five, U.S. economic performance. For the U.S. has focused its security responsibilities in support of the Taiwan Relations Act for decades. Yet today, as a result of more than 10 years of military modernization in the region, the flashpoint for misunderstanding and conflict at sea extends well beyond the Taiwan Strait. Since there are no conventional arms control regimes or pre-established frameworks designed to manage escalation, the real possibility exists for conflict in the maritime domain that is not at the time or place or duration of our choosing. The absence of a regime or framework to detention the region also creates the equally real probability for conflict that is regional in, con in context, extending well beyond the borders of the Taiwan Strait and involving U.S. treaty allies, regional partners, as well as multinational commercial interests. For very real strategic as well as operational reasons, we place a high premium on deterrence and conflict prevention strategies based on a tested formula of forward presence and cooperative relationships with our allies and friends in the region. Reassurance to our ally and partner Japan is a critical function of forward deployed U.S. forces. Forward presence is the face of U.S. resolve. It presents the nation with the capability as well as the opportunity to exercise U.S. leadership through appropriate, timely, and consequential actions, actions that are designed to address or resolve the coercive, unsafe, or unhealthy conditions that can affect economies, populations, and nations. So to move the agenda forward at the conference today,
It's critical to shape the foundation for the panel discussions and underscore why this is such an important topic. Professor Kerry Tork, in the letter to the Financial Times, summed up the difficulty of assessing the complexity of this modern economic world through a simplistic but dated lens. Before the advent of the supply chain, he said, every industrial country produced its products practically from start to finish within its own borders. This is not the case in today's interconnected world where all the manufacturers use industrial components made in various countries. In the past, countries used the military to extract favorable trade from weaker parties, which produced an unfortunate yet predictable path when competition among powers over spheres of influence resulted in bloody conflicts, with the losing party waiting eagerly to take revenge in the next war. So for the panels, the United States has moved from a position of strategic ambiguity in the region to clarity. But there are second and third order effects that come with that decision. While the move to, move, uh, the move to announce with clarity our view of the region and what our interests are, it has been met with now a series of steps that countries are questioning and asking for themselves. What does this mean? In my view, it means that we should expect the test, and we are seeing this in the Philippines today, where China will, will openly probe the commitment the United States makes to the Philippines. The United States has taken a view where we do not try to decide or adjudicate the outcome of these historic disputes, yet we have treaty partners and allies who have a very clear view of what their positions are when it comes to these historic disputes. Where is the United States position when it comes to the alliances that we have in the region? Number two, what is unique about the considerations for discussions related to tension, escalation, and crisis management in the maritime domain? And why is it especially relevant for today's discussion? Well, today, the importance of sea lines of communication connect those raw materials, those industrial suppliers, and those manufacturing centers. So any potential conflict impacts more than just the aggressor state. It, it has the potential to impact the entire global community. So why is this challenge unique, and why should we highlight it in the maritime domain? In the maritime domain, we operate across great distances with imperfect intelligence, an incomplete picture, and we must exercise individual judgment and therefore must operate with autonomy to evaluate intent. The ability to evaluate intent is much more difficult at sea. At sea, commanders evaluate radar returns, the number of ships in formation, their direction, their geometry, and deductively conclude intent. And therefore, it's easy to get wrong. <coughs> Anybody remember DeSoto patrols? DeSoto patrols were off the coast of Vietnam in 1964. I can promise you that the Turner Joy and Maddox had never uh, been given any order or ever had any intention to start a war that would cost 58,000 lives. Those were ships that were collecting intelligence passively. If you were to remember the name Jim Stockdale, he wrote a book called In Love and War, when he came back after seven years in captivity and won the Medal of Honor. And in chapter one, he describes the events that took place in 1964, when the Turner Joy and the Maddox thought they were under attack. He was the one that went out off the catapult that night, following directions given to him by radar control operators of where to send their ordnance what to fire. Stockdale landed at the end of that night, described it as a Chinese fire drill. A very confusing mess. Never saw anything out there. And then he was woken at 3 o'clock the next morning by a knock on his stateroom door that said, uh, sir, you need to get ready for the brief. What brief? For the attack. What attack? As a reprisal to the attack last night. What attack last night? And that's how Vietnam started. So you don't think this is important. You think this is local. 
We are watching how history is trying to inform us. These things happen at sea. USS Liberty was bombed by the Israelis in 1967. USS Pueblo was taken by North Korea. No one started out the day thinking that they were going to put their nation in the middle of a crisis. So not every nation interprets or makes judgments at sea the same way we do, and we can get it wrong. Finally, the maritime and the mariner frame of reference gives us ample opportunity to develop, I think, confidence-building measures. Everyone shares the risks of the sea and the maritime environment. Therefore, there are easily developed, practical, tangible proposals that are readily within reach that would serve the interests of fellow mariners and create better platforms for transnational challenges such as terrorism, organized crime, illegal poaching, or trafficking. When we know each other's interests, when we understand the language and the taxonomy of the framework, then we can work towards confidence-building measures. Our operational goal in the Pacific has been and always will be to have the intended effect of providing reassurance to the region as we concurrently focus on supporting economic growth and increasing coordination on transnational issues. Our goal simply was to give leadership time and space to make deliberative decisions to determine how and when to advance goals for the region, how and when to develop partnerships, and how and when to diffuse tension and prevent conflict, instead of thrusting the nation by some outrageous mistake, headfirst into a crisis from some strategic surprise, some local action that has become international in scope and lights off the region. Today, we hear and we read about world leaders, leaders in Japan, in China, in the United States. And their words say they want an economic uh, environment, an environment that is free from coercive and market, uh, free from coercion and open for market-based economies to grow. There is a real need for cooperation in the Asia Pacific region. The presence of so many here today is reason enough to be optimistic. While our leaders continue to promote cooperative partnerships at the national level, what this conference represents is an actionable roadmap to achieve the articulated goals of leaders and the desire of people in the region. All of us realize that unchecked and uncorrected, the path to tension and confrontation leads to violence, destruction, and the enmity that lasts for generations. Then we all lose. Thank you. Good morning. We are going to follow up with um, uh, Admiral Welsh's uh, speech with an exciting panel. And let me introduce the panelists. Um, first to go is um, Dr. Alexis Duden. Um, uh, Professor Duden is, uh, uh, teaches at University of Connecticut. Her research focus on North East Asian um, modern history through a legacy of Japanese empire. She has been the author, she's the author of multiple books, and two already published, Japan's Colonial Colonization of Korea, Discourse and Power, and the second book is Troubled Apologies Amongst Japan, Korea, and the United States. And she's currently working on the new book, Island, Empire, Nation, A History of Modern Japan. Um, and our second speaker would be uh, um, Dr. Micah Muscolini. He is a professor at uh, Georgetown University. He's um, a specialist in environmental history of late imperial and modern China. And his first book is Fission War and Environmental Change in Late Imperial and Modern China. And he had hold membership um, uh, of the School of History, Historical Study at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton and um, a Mellon Fellowship. And um, our third speaker would be Dean Bill Tsutsui. Um, Bill, uh, Dean Tsutsui has been an expert on 
multiple field and uh, uh, he he has been an author of books of uh, shif shifting focus and um, <laughs> uh, expand expand new territories or waters <laughs> and uh, uh, her, his first book uh, entitles banking policy in Japan uh, American effort at reform during the occupation and second <laughs> one is manufacturing ideology scientific management in 20th century Japan. And the third highly acclaimed popular book is uh, Gaozola in my mind, 50 years of the king of masters. And I'm, I'm sure uh, you all know the, the, the fame of um, Jin Suzui's toys <laughs> in his office. And uh, last, last even but not least, um, uh, Japan's popular culture and globalization. And I had the privilege of using it last year uh, in my class. And it was, it was a very good hit and uh, synthesized uh, seemingly um, uh, a permanent popularity of, of a Japanese public culture that that's not sought out, and that that uh, uh, book with economy sought these these different phenomena out for us. So, uh, without further ado, let's welcome our panelist, um, myself, <laughs> uh, Lin Xiao. <laughs> Lin Xiao. Um, I'm a specialist of modern China cultural history. I teach here at SMU. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you so much for including me in today's, yesterday, and today's very, very uh, informative discussion and, and potentially hair-raising discussion. <laughs> I, I appreciate very much the Admiral's remarks that this is real, boys, <laughs> and, and we need to think of it that way. Um, I'd speak into the microphone. I, for the obvious reason, I'm a historian, and uh, Secretary Steinberg last evening raised the question of why, the big why question. Why now? What's going on? It's difficult for historians to think that way. We deal with how and what, and it's a more tangible approach to answering this, chiefly because we know we're never going to be able to tell you why. And um, right now, something big is going on in this region. We all know that. Um, in my work, I like to think of this as two separate spinning disks at the same time. One are the region's so-called history wars, the ongoing legacies and hangovers of the mid, well, first half of the 20th century that in recent years have hit the streets throughout the region. Things that had long been managed in backroom discussion are now fodder for the internet, as well as major protests in all the countries we're talking about. And what we've seen since roughly 2000 is that the territorial disputes in the region writ large have supplanted the voices of the survivors of these words, the living victims of the mid 20th century. You could make the simple assumption that as these people are dying off, something else is replacing them. There are all kinds of reasons to give. It's a noticeable trend that the rocks in the region have taken over the voices. With that, um, and I'm very glad that Professor Hollifield referred to this as a classroom, I, um, I've done my homework, especially for the students involved, and I'm trying to answer now the history of the history of the rights to the region. And I'm going to be speaking specifically about the East China Sea, uh, particularly in a Japanese context, and before uh, Micah and Bill's more precise analysis. So please forgive what will seem broad by comparison, but I think at this juncture, it's helpful to understand uh, that the East China Sea, writ large, has moved from what international law understood for quite some time as an international water, high seas space during the late 19th and early 20th century to today, the late 20th, early 21st century, of what I think can best be described as zones of wholly overlapping parabolas. And now, if I, how do I start this? I just touch it? Is that all I have to do? Because I have some slides to let you know where we are in the world. I just have to hit this. That. 
Excellent. Okay. This is the East China Sea writ large. Uh, the Ryukyu Islands are important. Can't really see mainland Japan on this. Um, this is what's going on that hits the news. And these overlapping claims have everything to do with the second spinning disk, which is the introduction of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, provisions and rules, which were not around during the first half of the 20th century when those terrible histories that are still being battled on the streets happened. But since this international, new legal international regime has gone into effect in the mid-1990s, states in their own interests necessarily act according to the law by making these claims. Um, and so we've got a very different map in play. Um, so I'd like to take us way back to 1852 uh, when the concept of a high seas space entered East Asia for the first time. In 1852, a mutiny known as the Robert Bone Incident, involving about 400 Chinese laborers, also known as coolies, murdering their captain, a man from New Haven, Connecticut, who also happened to be the ship's owner, tried to take control of the ship. This took place somewhere between Taiwan and Ishigaki, and forgive the fuzzy nature of this, the red circle is actually Yonaguni Island, Japan's farthest or closest to Taiwan. I believe the incident took place somewhere around there. Really from the ship's log, nobody can quite tell where they were. Um, the unusual thing about this incident is not that it took place. Mutinies were incredibly common in the mid-19th century. But what is unusual is like it's very famous, uh, the very famous mutiny in 1839, the Amistad, so many people on all sides survived and had a story to tell and interests at stake. The American delegation in China was led by Peter Parker, not Spider-Man, but perhaps Peter Parker, who was based in Guangzhou, uh, then known as Canton. He led the charge, it being the murder of an American citizen on, American, on an American ship. But he could not have been clearer in his thinking and rationale for how this case would be pursued. He, the American delegation, would capture and arrest the surviving mutineers, again about 400 men, with premeditated, quote, piracy under the law of nations. And remember, although the precise location of this mutiny can never be known, right away the Americans determined, quote, that it occurred on the high seas, not within the jurisdiction of China. This is important because notably, no other country is mentioned as a possibility. Two months after the mutiny, Consul Parker wrote Secretary of State Daniel Webster to explain that, strictly speaking, under the laws of the United States, the case could be pursued that way. It would be more expedient and beneficial to American interests to follow the course of piracy and work together with Chinese officials. Quote, what expedience expediency dictates, I conceive, is also justified by the law of nations. Now, racing through this history now, suffice it to say, the Chinese would have none of it. They did not balk at the use of international law, which they would in the coming decades, uh, nor did they find anything unusual about the notion of the high seas, but they returned the incident to land, to the coastal area of Fuzhou, where the ship had originated, to what was then known as the buying and selling of pigs, coolie slavery, which ultimately the diplomats learned they could not protest. Should American diplomats have pressed further at the time, Secretary of State Daniel Webster would likely have been involved, which would have been difficult to say the least, as less than a decade earlier, he himself had signed a treaty with the Queen of England's representative, Baron Ash Burton, to end the slave trade on the Atlantic high seas. In an antebellum United States of increasing tension in revolving around the African-American Atlantic slave trade, the American Pacific China trade functioned as an enormously lucrative shadow economy for New England and mid-Atlantic businessmen, who in Washington in the early 1850s would risk introducing an entirely new dimension of the slave trafficking debates that already imperiled America's national existence. Now, the forgotten nature of this potentially climactic history usefully circles us to understanding that the 1850s, which is not so long ago in East Asia, the 1850s in the East China Sea remained a legally open, 
even lawless, high seas space whose islands and people were as ambiguously claimed as the water surrounding them. As it would transpire, the Ryukyu King's emissary on Ishigaki Island, which is the island that claims jurisdiction over the disputed islands today, his name is Kariwakate Kugu Miyata, would provide the best account of this loose state of affairs and make clear that ultimately the Ryukyu Kingdom, which we all refer to as Okinawa today, claimed control of the area and did so at its own expense. A full year after the mutiny, in March 1853, Kariwakate Kugumiara sent a letter from Ishigaki to the Shuri, the Okinawan king's castle, um, describing locals' displeasure at still, looking, at still having to look after the surviving Chinese. About 172 men were still stranded on Ishigaki, and yet, according to the official's report, were depleting the islanders' food supplies. The letter does not elaborate, but moreover, the women apparently were so scared of these Chinese men that they refused to go to the shoreline, where they dyed fabric used to pay the island's taxes to the Ryukyu king, which in turn he would use to pay portions of his taxes to the Satsuma lord, to the Tokugawa shogun, as well as to the Qing court in China, which ultimately ended up with five different competing interests negotiating this problem. On behalf of the locals, Kariwakate pleaded for a ship to take these Chinese men home, lest the islanders fall far behind on the taxes owed to the Ryukyu king. King Shotai conferred with the Qing officials who determined that the islands were indeed under Ryukyu control. Eventually, two Ryukyu and Okinawan ships returned the men to Fuzhou. Now, the introduction of the notion of the high seas at this time came together with international law, which with which a revolutionizing Meiji Japan would make clear in the early days of their new nation that they would adopt in their entirety, entirely. This meant the notion of the high seas and territorial waters became Japanese practice in the 1870s and 80s. What was also introduced at this time, therefore, was a way of controlling the islands that fell in the middle of this watery space. Oh, dear. Well, it's truncated, which is unfortunate for it, but let's not worry about that. Uh, <laughs> what was the most important, well, I do want to actually find one that has the Okinawan Islands on it, because it's the Ryukyu Islands which are increasingly the most important to the early revolutionary Meiji government in the 1870s. Naming Japan's, asserting Japan's control over these islands is what mattered. And they did so by annexing them uh, to Japan, ultimately in 1879, to the extent that the Chinese were not happy about this, as we heard yesterday about lengthy tributary systems. When President Ulysses Grant visited the Meiji Emperor in 1879, Chinese officials had encouraged him to protest Japan's annexation of the Ryukyu, which he did, and to which uh, the Emperor of Japan said, but quote, relations with China are peaceful. And um, Grant also pointed out that the Chinese had urged him to mention that they were not so pleased about Japan's increasing incursions in Taiwan. In 1874, the Imperial Japanese Navy and Army fought its first overseas battles, killing about um, 3,000 villagers in Taiwan. And uh, this drew great uh, displeasure in China. And uh, they had encouraged uh, Grant to convey this the Meiji Emperor said relations with China could not be more peaceful. But this brings a different island also onto our radar. So we've got the Ryukyu Islands, we've got Taiwan. <coughs> Having accomplished these maneuvers, we would end up in our first modern war between Japan and China, 1894-95, which draws us to the dispute today. I promise you history can circle to the present. Um, because the Treaty of Shemonoseki, as I'm sure many of you in this room have studied, includes the war booty clause that Taiwan in its entirety, as well as adjacent islands, would be new pieces of the Japanese empire. <coughs> Now, this is also where we get into the dispute with China today. Taiwan long has claimed that the islands disputed today are what was granted to Japan in that clause. What's also happening at this time, I'd like to point out, is that this 
maneuver the Ryukyu and Taiwan control is creating a new sort of inland sea space for modern Japanese consciousness. You know, the, the, the ocean is called the East China Sea. <laughs> no one's really confused about its location. But it becomes part of a notion of Japanese control through gaining control over the islands that are lying throughout. And it's at this time, on the verge of the 20th century, therefore, that yes, on the one hand, there's still a China border to the west, and yes, Japan is maintaining a notion of high seas, international seas, but the three-mile territorial waters are now increasingly Japanese, as well as the islands through them. So today we have a potentially big problem over these rocks. Now, the Japanese Foreign Ministry maintains that the Treaty of Shimonoseki, which comes later in 1895, has nothing to do with anything, that the government of Japan, quote, made a cabinet decision on January 14th, 1895, to erect a marker on the islands and formally incorporate the Senkaku into the territory of Japan did not seize the islands as a result of the Sino-Japanese War. Criticism is completely unfounded. Well, in fact, what is important to understand is what happened in 1894 and 95. How did these little islands have any Japanese imprimatur on them at all? And through that history, we can learn more of the history of the shifting meaning of islands from above the waterline, where they were in international law at the time, to those competing parabolas of today, which is the ocean floor. Koga Tatsuhiro from um, southern Japan, in the entrepreneurial spirit of the day, established an albatross butchery on these islands, and as well as a fish drying factory to make the basic ingredient for miso soup. This is what <laughs> islands were used for. This is similar to the other, the other islands that Japan disputes today, which were in the north and were good for sea lions and seal pelts, things like that. That was the raw material people wanted. And albatross butcheries were actually enormously lucrative. Their feathers commanded quite a high price in Paris. Um, the Economist's Asia editor, Dominic Ziegler, has noted, however, that no other family, the Koga family, is more closely associated with the annihilation of an entire species. The albatross <laughs> suffered a great loss at the Koga family's hands. Now, I raise all this here because the 1895 rocks have fallen under Ishigaki, the southern island's control, um, since this moment. And they remained there until 1945, uh, when Japan lost the war. Between 1945 and 1972, they're under American control. All right. So what happens in 1945 that matters to our story today is this man, Harry Truman. <laughs> Very shortly after the end of World War II, Harry Truman on September 28th did a unilateral redefinition of the high seas. The longstanding three mile territorial sea limit went out the window in Proclamation 2667, quote, the government of the United States regards the natural resources of the subsoil and the seabed of the continental shelf beneath the high seas, but contiguous to the coasts of the United States as appertaining to the United States subject to its jurisdiction and control. So with three mile limits out the window, the White House quickly explained, petroleum geologists believe that portions of the continental shelf beyond the three mile limit contain valuable oil deposits. Now Japan was under US control at the time. China was not in a position to be examining the space for oil. We aren't talking about that between 1945 and 1968 when the first oil reports are submitted to the United Nations. We're talking about the United States was using these islands for target practice, as they were many of the other contested islands today. They were under US control. Now. This brings me to the person whose history I'd like to end with, that's the confusing EEZs, contiguous zones, et cetera. This man, Kedoshiro Yotake's personal history, I think, is one to end with to think of possibilities. Because what's also going on, we talk a lot, especially in international relations theory, of this is a problem of state to state, China versus Japan. Where does the United States fit in? But this is also a hotly debated problem within Japan in terms of how best to remember the history of this ocean's space. <laughs> 
Ketashiro was uh, two years old, excuse me, Ketashiro was, um, <coughs> excuse me, Ketashiro was two years old on July 3rd, 1945, when American planes bombed the refugee ship that he had boarded together with his mother and younger siblings. They were fleeing Ishigaki during what is known by historians and Okinawans as the Typhoon of Steel. They were fleeing Ishigaki as refugees on a marked refugee ship to Taiwan. They boarded the last ship out. American planes bombed it at 2 p.m. Ketashiro watched his older brother's head get blown from his shoulders. The following day, survivors made it to Uotsori Island, which is the island at the height, at the center of the contests today, whereupon on August 18th, three days after Japan's surrender, a Japanese troop ship rescued Ketashiro and the surviving others. Now, what's happened today is a contest in Japanese society over how to remember this history. A group that has been in action since the reversion, known roughly as Protect the Senkaku as Japanese territory, would use the January 14th cabinet decision date as the date they would like to make a national holiday for Japan, but they use the substance of the Ketashiro family history to appeal to the public. And so you see their actions in the summertime when groups of rising sun flag waving people um, that one, crit one critic refers to as a motley crew of fantabulous outsiders tries to board the island and claim in the name of Japan this terrible history, and yet it's on the wrong day. And I think that's something to think about because Ketashiro himself could not be clear and has repeated, in, especially in recent years, that um, when such politicians refer, call to him, he says, our group's aims and prayers are for no more war. It's completely the opposite of your aims from your organization, so I cannot agree, do not use my history. He's clear, the Senkakus belong to Okinawans, no more war. Attempts, however, to politicize and confuse his history block out history and law changes altogether. When Japan first claimed the Senkaku in 1895, the territory above the waterline was the prize. Today, owning an island anywhere includes the potentially vast areas of ocean floor and minerals that come together with that. Attempts today to direct Japanese society's focus to 1895 instead of the 1945 history, let alone what happened in the, throughout the East China Sea between 1945 and 1972, obfuscates all of these major transformations in ocean sovereignty, which render, going back to the 1895 decision, an artifact of the past and moot in law today. Thank you. now from Professor Dutton's brilliant talk about the East China Sea to my far from precise, despite her <laughs> promises, presentation about the South China Sea, right? So China, Taiwan, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, and also the Philippines assert competing territorial and jurisdictional claims to this maritime territory, in part over its possibly extensive oil and natural gas reserves. To be sure, the territorial disputes in the South China Sea do not derive exclusively from resource conflict. I'm not saying that. There's clearly much more at stake. The situation is far more complex and multifaceted. However, I would contend that the existence of energy resources, or at least potential energy resources, does a great deal to intensify territorial disputes. With global energy demand rising, many countries in the region are seeking new ways to meet their long-term energy needs. <laughs> These factors have made the South China Sea into what Michael Clare, in his highly influential and widely read book, Resource Wars, calls the fulcrum of energy competition in the Asia-Pacific Asia region. Several countries, including China, Vietnam, and the Philippines, have moved forward with plans to exploit the South China Sea's 
potentially abundant hydrocarbon resources. Tensions have increased, with claimants beginning to fear that access to potential oil and natural gas reserves is a zero-sum game, and that they have to exploit them before other countries can. China, meanwhile, continues to issue warnings against outside parties. And when China talks about outside parties, it's talking about, of course, the United States becoming embroiled in the territorial disputes. So that's the kind of background for what I'm going to be talking about today. As one component of these growing tensions in the South China Sea, conflict has flared in recent years between China and the Philippines over control of the area's oil and natural gas deposits, right? A major point of contention has been this place, which you can see circled there on the map of all of these extremely complicated <laughs> overlapping territorial claims. This is actually a great map um, from a wonderful website. It's a uh, What's it called? Uh, SouthChinaSea.org, I believe. Um, it has all kinds of wonderful information on it. Um, this is the Reed Bank, often referred to in Filipino sources as Recto Bank, right? A rocky shoal about 155 miles west of the Philippine island of Palawan. And this is what it looks like. Chinese, they call it Lila Tan, which is uh, the sort of, I don't know how they got that name, but I guess it's just this sort of alliteration. But anyway, this is what it looks like. It really is a rocky shoal and not much else, right? The Philippines claim that Reed Bank is within its 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. The PRC sees it as part of the Spratly Islands. The 200 tiny little islets, not much like, basically similar to this, some are larger, but more or less it's the same thing, which are claimed in, entire, in their entirety by China, Taiwan, and Vietnam, as well as partially by the Philippines. In 2005, the Philippine government awarded a contract to the UK-based oil and gas company Forum Energy, whose majority shareholder happens to be Philex Mining Corporation of the Philippines, to conduct seismic surveys in the Reed Bank's Sampaguita gas field. And this is actually a map from Forum Energy's website, which shows exactly where the gas field is located. As you can see down on the lower right, that is Palawan uh, Island of the Philippines. Forum surveys indicated the presence of some 3.4 trillion cubic feet of gas, a potentially significant source of energy and income. And in February 19, in 2010, the government of the Philippines extended Forum's contract, and the company brought in the MV Veritas Voyager, a chartered survey vessel to begin exploring locations to sink appraisal wells. Those actions, of course, did not go unnoticed. In March 2010, two patrol boats from the PRC's Marine Surveillance Force approached the Veritas Voyager near Reed Bank and forced it to withdraw. The Chinese vessels ordered the survey ship to cease its activities holding that Reed Bank was under Chinese jurisdiction. In the days that followed this run-in, Philippine President Benigno Aquino III, actually I have a Filipino grad student who said, you must say the third, and this is very important. It's not the other one. So he sent patrol aircraft and, and escort vessels to accompany Veritas Voyager away from the area, held an emergency cabinet meeting, and sent his def defense secretary and armed forces chief to the Western command of the Philippines military, which is just in this area, as a show of strength. Manila also lodged a formal complaint with the UN and sought support from ASEAN in forging a common position on the issue. Beijing, not surprisingly, responded by accusing the Philippines of invading China's territorial waters. Given all of this controversy and, and tension, Forum Energy decided it was going to halt operations. 
But the company plans to restart drilling in Reed Bank in the near future despite Chinese objections. The Philippines has promised that it will provide patrol ships and surveillance planes to protect exploration vessels. And given the Philippines' clear intention to uphold its claim to this territory, many commentators warn that tensions could escalate into violence if China intervenes to stop the drilling. So this episode marks the most recent incident, instance of a claimant state granting hydrocarbon concessions in disputed territories in the South China Sea as a way of exercising jurisdiction. But it is certainly not the first. International tensions centering on Reed Bank's hydrocarbon reserves first emerged amidst the oil crisis of the 1970s, when pursuit of oil and gas resources transformed it into a hotly contested area. In the 1970s, as in recent years, oil exploration undertaken by multinational energy corporations in conjunction with the Philippines catalyzed disputes over Reed Bank. It's a very complicated story. Basically, the Philippine government entered into an agreement with a Swedish oil exploration company in the mid-1970s. China got very upset, so did Vietnam. When it was discovered that US oil enterprises were also involved, the American government freaked out because there's this issue of, well, what if China or Vietnam happens to attack a U.S. oil exploration vessel, what do we do? And so there's all of this documentation, but ultimately that enterprise didn't really yield any tangible results, and the conflict just kind of fizzled out by the beginning of the 1980s. So at that time, protests issued by China and other nations claiming Reed Bank um, prompted the Philippines to reassert its own jurisdictional claims and strengthen its military presence, thereby heightening tension. So I was actually struck when I was looking through these archives, which I first came across in Taiwan in the Republic of China Ministry of Foreign Affairs archive. Um, I was struck by the similarity between what was going on in the 1970s and what's gone on in the last few years between China and the Philippines. But what I'm going to do today is forego the details of the story, which if you're interested, you can read about in the paper, which I think is gonna be posted on the website. So if you wanna hear this, it's a, it's a, it's a good story, uh, and I definitely recommend that you take a look at it, but I'm gonna actually not go into that in detail. Instead, what I'm going to do is look at the earlier period of tensions surrounding oil exploration in Reed Bank as a way of offering historical perspective on one aspect of current disputes in the South China Sea and lend some insight into the dynamics of present day controversies. So, what I've found in my study of these disputes in the 1970s is that territorial disputes seem to be pushing claimants in the South China Sea to the brink of military confrontation, and yet in the end, armed conflict failed to materialize, right? Um, so what I have discerned in this study is that many of the preconditions for conflict in the South China Sea, untapped resources, overlapping claims, willingness to deploy force, or at least an apparent willingness to deploy force, and outside powers with vital regional interests have existed in the South China Sea for at least 40 years, all the way up into the present. But what's also significant is that violent disputes surrounding Reed Bank have not actually taken place, right? So how do you explain that? Responding to assertive actions aimed at gaining access to energy resources, 
political leaders and diplomatic actors have moderated their behavior, refrained from deploying military forces, and stressed peaceful resolution and maintaining the status quo. At the same time, as these controversies flared, dialogues and negotiations occurred at various levels. This has been a consistent theme since the 1970s. So what are the diplomatic, economic, and military factors that explain these outcomes? Well, one thing that we can look at is the set of priorities that informed the PRC's decision making. Though it has never, ever, ever, ever shied away from proclaiming its absolute sovereignty over Reed Bank and the rest of the Spratly Islands, in a lot of ways, up until at least very recently, China's priorities have been elsewhere, right? Diplomatically, the PRC's relations with Vietnam had utterly deteriorated in the mid-1970s to the point that the two countries went to war, uh, while China was also expanding its ties with ASEAN, including the Philippines, right? So arguing with the Philippines was not a big priority for China in the 1970s. Vietnam was more important. And on top of that, after Nixon's visit in 1972, China was engaged in a budding rapprochement with the United States, which open hostilities against the Philippines would have obviously placed in serious jeopardy. During the 1970s, moreover, the PRC's economy was relative, relatively stagnant, right? And China did not have anywhere near the demand for energy that it does today. Indeed, up until 1993, China was an oil exporting country, not a net importer. It's really amazing to think about how quickly that shift has taken place for China. But since the mid-1990s, PRC leaders have come to recognize China's dependence on oil imports and started to seek new energy sources to sustain China's remarkable economic expansion. So this is a big change from today, uh, from the 1970s to today. Militarily, China possessed a far less formidable navy in the 1970s than it currently does. The PRC thus did not have the willingness the capacity or even the need to vigorously assert its territorial claims up until very, very, very recently. The situation in the 1970s thus stands in stark contrast to the current one. Over the past decade, the People's Liberation Navy has expanded and modernized, creating a power asymmetry in the South China Sea that clearly favors China. The South China Sea Fleet was China's weakest in the 1970s, now it is equal or superior to all of the others. So this is a cartoon from The Economist, which you can always count on for a good cartoon, that kind of sums up this power asymmetry and how it, it, how it affects relations in the region. The Philippines, like other Southeast Asian nations, worries that China's recently acquired naval capabilities will enable it to resolve the sovereignty issue militarily. Despite efforts to modernize and upgrade, the Philippines' naval capabilities are very weak. Whoa, what happened? I clicked the button by accident. That's OK. Yeah. No. Yeah. There we go. OK. Right, so the Philippines' naval capabilities are still very weak compared to China's. And the same also goes for Vietnam. Nor can the Philippines or any other claimant count on external assistance. Since the 1970s, Washington has repeatedly stressed that the Mutual Defense Treaty of 1951 does not cover Philippine claimed territories in the Spratlys. Only the US Navy has the power to counterbalance China's, but the US does not want to get involved in questions of sovereign jurisdiction. It is not at all clear how far the US would go to support the Philippines or any of its other allies in the region if conflict were to break out. One point that I want to stress is that transnational resource competition involves a multiplicity of actors with diverse interests. Today, as in the past, a multifaceted array of priorities and calculations inform their decisions. 
the PRC's assertive behavior in the South China Sea risks compromising the image of China's peaceful rise that the government wishes to project. China may also shy away from employing overt, overt force for fear of a backlash from its neighbors in Asia, as well as from the US. For other countries, in addition to potential military reprisals from China, overly assertive behavior risks alienating a major trading partner, and in this regard, the Philippines faces an especially delicate balancing act. So given these extensive but rather fragile ties that exist among the countries in the region, uh, potential political and economic risks, it might be said, will act to militate against conflict, at least in the near term. At the same time, however, and this is something that we really want to be aware of, policymakers should not rule out the possibility of minor disputes escalating into big ones. Things can spiral out of control. The increasingly fractious and, and dangerous incidents like the one that occurred at Reed Bank in 2012 thus highlight the urgent need for multilateral conflict avoidance mechanisms that can institutionalize avenues for nonviolent cooperation. It is also worth noting that competition for oil and natural gas in the South China Sea depends not only upon national claims to those energy deposits, but also upon the technological capability to access those resources. Today, it, as in the 1970s, countries like the Philippines depend on foreign technology and expertise to access offshore energy deposits, and even just to carry out exploration. The Philippines, as well as Vietnam, seek ties with foreign firms for commercial reasons, and also to give foreign partners a stake in these territorial, uh, territorial disputes. Unlike in the 1970s, however, the PRC today possesses the technology to extract deep water petroleum and gas. China's offshore drilling capacities introduce a new factor into these transnational dynamics of resource ex exploitation. What this means is that the Philippines and other Asian countries no longer have to look exclusively to America and Europe for cooperative partnerships. And indeed, since 2012, Philex Petroleum Company, which is of course the sh controlling shareholder in Forum Energy, has engaged with, in talks with China National Offshore Corporation for possible joint development of the Reed Bank's gas deposits, an arrangement that could do a lot to ease tensions, at least in the bilateral relationship. How Vietnam would feel about that is another story. Um, however, nationalist sentiments in the Philippines, as well as in China, not to mention in Vietnam, which equate any form of compromise with sacrificing territorial sovereignty, present a great impediment to any sort of negotiated or cooperative solution. So while transnational agreement appears far off, there really isn't any reason to rule it out completely. So one of the points that I want to make is that when we're thinking about what's going on in the South China Sea or the East China Sea, we need to carefully differentiate between rhetoric and reality and think really carefully about the relationship between the two. What I have found, I guess, is that East Asian states are aware that aggressive competition for energy resources at least in the South China Sea, however they might be for sustaining economic growth rates, carries real risks. Even as they engage in assertive actions to gain access to limited resources and stubbornly assert their territorial claims, actors have in many ways moderated their behavior to maintain the status quo and to diffuse tensions. Despite the existence of overlapping claims and increasing demand for energy, resource wars are hardly inevitable. So I'll end on that rather optimistic note and turn the podium over to Professor Satsui. Well, I just want to say what a pleasure it is to be here this morning and to be on a panel with two such fine uh, historians uh, and to have this opportunity uh, to join them in contributing historical perspectives uh, to the important contemporary issues that we're uh, focused on uh, in this conference. 
Now, the basic argument of my comments this morning uh, is really quite simple, though as a historian, that means I can't possibly say it in few words. Um, essentially, though, what I want to add to our conversation is this. Japan's record of imperialism in East Asia is well known, but that record has almost always been conceived solely in terms of terrestrial conquests, peninsulas, provinces and nations, regions, and most appropriately for today, archipelagos, islands, and rocks. <laughs> but I would argue Japanese imperialism from the late 19th century up through World War I and then to the present day has also been very much a maritime project. And not just in the sense of the oceans being a conduit for empire, of Japan using the seas to project naval power or create communication and trade links between the metropole and the colonial periphery. Up to 1945, Japan's incremental domination and exploitation, particularly through its commercial fisheries of its surrounding seas and eventually of more distant oceans, paralleled the nation's economic and military advance on the Asian continent. Moreover, the growth of Japan's pelagic empire, as I call it, was propelled by many of the same political and economic forces and pursued under the same ideological banner as Japan's continental expansion. After Japan's defeat in World War II, the nation's fisheries were resurgent, while its empire was not. But with many continuities with the pelagic empire of the past and conditioned by American dominance in the Pacific and the accelerating oceanic enclosure movement, Japan would establish in the second half of the 20th century an informal empire of fisheries on a global scale. Now it goes without saying that the Japanese people have long practiced intensive coastal fishing and whaling. Japan only began to develop extensive offshore fisheries in the late 19th century, however, as the rapidly modernizing nation increasingly integrated into the global economy. Advanced fisheries technologies introduced from the West played a significant role in expanding the reach and productivity of Japanese fishermen. Modern otter trawlers and motor-powered tuna boats imported from Europe and soon copied by Japanese shipbuilders allowed for the establishment of Japan's first offshore fisheries. Significantly, these first steps into more distant fishing grounds paralleled the growth of Japan's terrestrial empire. With new territories won in the Sino-Japanese and Russo-Japanese wars, Japanese fishing operations moved progressively beyond home waters and through the neighboring seas of East Asia. By any measure, Japanese fisheries grew rapidly in the first decades of the 20th century. Between 1908 and 1920, the offshore catches of Japanese fishermen expanded fivefold. By the early 1930s, as fisheries production swelled to over 5 million tons a year, Japan could legitimately claim to be the world's leading fishing nation. From the perspective of the Ministry of Agriculture and Commerce, Japan's progress seemed almost inevitable. And I quote here from a 1904 uh, a paper. With the steady increase of population, the demand for fishing products is showing a striking advance, a condition still further accelerated by the increasing demand from abroad. Under these circumstances, the fishermen can no longer remain satisfied with coasting work alone, but are obliged to a greater extent than ever before to venture into the open sea and even to the distant coasts of Korea and the South Sea Islands. And indeed, while the yield from Japan's coastal waters did increase steadily in the decades prior to World War II, the major growth in production came in offshore and deep sea fisheries. Japan's trawlers first worked the rich grounds of the East China and Yellow Seas in 1921, began sweeping the South China Sea in 1927, and expanded operations into the Gulf of Tonkin in 1928. After Japan claimed the mandated islands of Micronesia from Germany as the spoils of World War I, Japanese boats ranged across the southwestern Pacific in search of tuna. Meanwhile, in northern waters, Japanese developed and dominated the crab fishery. Japanese crabbers started working the curals in 1909, 
and fleets of Japanese factory ships moved up and down the Siberian coast from 1922. The drive to expand production in Japan's fisheries expanded further in the 1930s. The impetus for these heightened efforts was not growing concern for food security or maintaining employment in the fishing industry at a time of global economic distress. Instead, Japan's fishermen were mobilized after the Manchurian incident as part of Japan's imperial project. And what they were expected to deliver was not food for Japanese tables or jobs for Japan's unemployed, but rather foreign exchange. The dollars, pounds, and Reichsmarks necessary to keep Japan's growing empire and military machine fed with imported oil, iron ore, and rubber. Thus, Japan's fisheries were focused, as never before, on exports, on developing new sources of marine products and finding markets for them abroad. Japanese canned salmon, crab, tuna, and sardines crowded grocery shelves from Britain to the Philippines, but especially in the United States. Inexpensive dried and salted fish poured into China and Southeast Asia, Huge processing ships swept the Bering Sea, producing large quantities of fish meal and liver oil, most of it for German consumers. And Japanese whalers, not a major international presence before 1930, became substantial suppliers of whale oil to the soap and margarine factories of Europe. As one commentator proclaimed in 1940, at the peak of Japan's pre-war fisheries, and I quote, the fishing industry serves Japan as an important source of foreign exchange. Her exports of marine products amount annually in value to 160 million yen, and thus rank third after raw silk and cotton yarn. Also, the fish cost practically nothing whereas raw cotton must be imported for the textile industry and vast mulberry plantations must be maintained by the silk growers. The growth of Japan's fisheries, and especially its export-oriented operations, was vigorously supported by the Japanese state. Japanese diplomats were tenacious in bargaining for fishing rights in treaty negotiations, especially with the Russians. And the ties between Japan's armed forces and its fishermen were always intimate. Canned seafood production was first nurtured by the government as a source of rations for soldiers and sailors. Decommissioned warships often entered the fishing fleet, and the Imperial Navy was regularly called upon to safeguard Japanese fishing operations in distant and disputed waters. Japanese fisheries interests could also count on substantial financial support from the state. As early as the 1890s, government subsidies supported the construction of state-of-the-art boats, underwrote the development of factory ships, and financed the establishment of advanced refrigeration facilities. Significantly, the Japanese authorities recognized that fishing was an industry, and as such, needed to be nurtured, guided, managed, and mobilized just as much as other strategic sectors, from shipbuilding to machine tools to mining. Indeed, one could argue that fisheries were an important early proving ground for Japan's nascent industrial policy that Chalmers Johnson traced back to the late 1920s and 1930s. Government bureaucrats took an active role in coordinating the growth of Japan's fishing industry, working particularly closely with a handful of large corporations that dominated Japan's modern export-oriented fisheries. They were also assertive in directing the industry towards strategic goals, especially with regard to opening new fishing grounds. Thus, the state encouraged and funded numerous reconnaissance expeditions where small groups of Japanese trawlers were sent into distant, unexploited waters. In the 1920s, such exploratory missions laid the foundations for large-scale Japanese operations in the South China Sea and the Bering Sea. And in the 1930s, expeditions worked the Bay of La Plata in Argentina, the Gulf of Carpentaria off Australia, and even the, Austra the Arabian Sea. This seemingly relentless expansion of Japanese fisheries 
supported by the power and the pocketbook of the Japanese state, had two consequences worth noting. The first, which I'll not talk about at length, uh, in this venue was environmental. The range and efficiency of Japanese fishermen put significant pressures on marine resources across the Pacific Ocean and its marginal seas. And as Japan's advanced high-quality trawlers and factory ships repeatedly exhausted the resources of one fishing ground, they methodically sought out ever more distant resource frontiers to maintain peak production. The second consequence of Japan's ascending fishing industry was political. As Japan earned an international reputation as a lawless predator and ruthless exploiter of the seas. The Russians were long highly sensitive to Japan's maritime intrusions, as were the Chinese, from bitter experiences in the East China Sea. In the United States, the sense of menace from Japan seemed to peak in 1937, when Japanese interests sent an exploratory expedition to harvest salmon in Bristol Bay. American observers condemned the intrusion as, quote, a damaging invasion and an attack. One correspondent for the New York Times wrote, and I quote, just as the Japanese military juggernaut rolls across China without regard for the amenities of civilization, so do these fishing vessels from Tokyo completely overlook conservation rules in their quest for the finny wealth of the ocean. <laughs> Thus, on the eve of Pearl Harbor, this is a good sort of representation of that, Japan commanded a pelagic empire as well as a terrestrial one. Japan had twice the fisheries production of any other nation on Earth, and its 1.4 million fishermen, processors, and aquaculturalists pulled heavy cultures from the Bering Sea to the Antarctic Ocean, from the Bay of Bengal to the continental shelf off of Mexico. The oceans were a central component in Japan's imperial vision, and Japan exploited them with all the thoroughness that it exploited the soybean fields of Manchuria or the mines of the Korean Peninsula. Ironically, though, just as Japan's landlocked empire would reach its height in the first months of the Pacific War, so its empire of fisheries would begin to retrench and fade. Offshore operations ground to a halt as most of Japan's large fishing vessels and many of its most expensive uh, experienced seamen were drafted into the war effort. Even coastal fisheries contracted significantly as endemic shortages especially of petroleum depressed production. In any case, as Japan embarked on its autonomous course in 1941, the primary impetus behind the Pelagic Empire, which was generating trade surpluses to fuel Japanese expansion, lost all of its momentum. When you were at war with America, you just didn't need those dollars quite so much. In the end, Although Japan's marine empire collapsed as dramatically as the terrestrial imperium, it left important legacies for the fisheries that would regenerate after Japan's defeat. Uh, and here is just a list uh, of what I, uh, I sort of pull out as sort of some of the main characteristics uh, of the Pelagic Empire that would go on, and I'll discuss just very briefly here, uh, became critical legacies uh, for the Japanese fisheries industry and its informal empire after uh, World War II. Now, I don't really have time here in this venue to talk about the ideological aspects of Japan's pelagic empire, about the ways in which the Japanese people imagined and articulated the vision of regional oceanic dominance. Let me just show one map, though, however. This is from the height of Japan's wartime stretch, and it may give you, I think, a little flavor of Japan's ambition uh, and its case for pelagic primacy. Based like its terrestrial empire, both on a sense of destiny, that somehow Japan as a na uh, an ocean nation was meant to dominate the Pacific, uh, but also on a more pragmatic argument. Uh, and that was that Japan's success in modernizing, in building the world's leading fishing industry, qualified it uniquely to dominate and lead the nations and waters of Asia. Now, I don't really have time to tell the entire post-war history of the Japanese fishing industry and the building of a new informal pelagic empire, but let me give you an extremely quick overview. 
1945, of course, Japan's fisheries were in ruins. The American occupation, however, recognized the importance of fishing to Japan, both in terms of the protein and calories provided to the local population, and even more importantly, of the fishing industry's centrality to Japan's export economy. With American sponsorship in rebuilding the fleet and progressively opening up fishing grounds, Japanese fishermen surpassed the largest annual catches prior to World War II, even before the end of the occupation in 1952. And Japan could thus rightly claim once again to be the world's top fishing nation. Between 1950 and 1960, Japanese fisheries production doubled. By 1973, it had doubled again. And although fishing is seldom credited with being a major component in Japan's miracle post-war economy, it very much contributed, just like the steel and automobile industries, to Japan's unprecedented and sustained economic expansion. Some of the soaring catch statistics can be credited to advances in technology, but the rapid resurgence of Japanese fisheries after the war was due in very large part to the legacies of the pelagic empire of the 1930s. Using a familiar repertoire of practices and strategies developed to support Japan's imperial ambitions and its march to war, the Japanese fishing industry would be mobilized once again in the wake of defeat as an important element in the new national drive for wealth and economic power. And indeed, one can do, go down this list and sort of tick off the ways in which these legacies continued to shape the development of Japanese fisheries after the war. So even in an age of accelerating territorialization of the world seas, Japan continued to benefit for, from mare liberum in fishing, just as the nation benefited from open world markets in selling electronics abroad or importing essential raw materials. The Japanese state picked up after the war just where it had left off before it. The fisheries agency established in 1948 became the government's focal point for guiding and supporting the fishing industry, providing subsidies and investment capital, educational and technical support, and once again, facilitating the new opening of fishing grounds around the world. Such assistance was particularly welcome as Japan's ruthlessly efficient fishermen overexploited and exhausted grounds with distressing regularity after the war. Japanese tuna fishing, for example, began in the Indian Ocean in 1952, was in the Atlantic by 1957, and soon spread into the Mediterranean and Caribbean. Bases for Japanese ships were built throughout the South Pacific, from New Caledonia to the Cook Islands, and joint ventures were established from Guatemala and Chile to Mozambique and Madagascar. Japanese trawlers plied the Persian Gulf, and Japanese fish meal factory ships spent summers in the Bering Sea and winters off the coast of Angola. By the mid-1960s, over 200 Japanese fishing vessels were based in foreign ports, including Tahiti, Port-au-Prince in Haiti, and Recife in Brazil. And not surprisingly, this increasingly global reach only intensified international sensitivities to Japanese fisheries practices, and above all, to Japanese whaling, which was insignificant economically, but captured headlines around the world. But Japan's post-war dominance in fisheries would ultimately be short-lived, undermined by aggressive competition from nations like the Soviet Union and China, by rising labor costs among Japanese fishermen, and by a domestic market in Japan whose appetites outstripped the ability of even Japan's formidable fleet to fully satisfy. And most significantly, the end of the long-standing and permissive international regime for accessing and extracting resources for the oceans dealt the Japanese fishing industry a major blow. Although Japan was among the last major maritime nations to accept the enclosure movement of the seas after World War II, the global adoption of 12-mile territorial waters and 200-mile EEZs could be seen as the start of a new phase in Japan's oceanic adventurism. With the loss of many overseas fishing grounds from the 1970s, Japan's fishing industry began to decline, and the nation rapidly moved from a net exporter to an aggressive importer of fisheries products. 
Japanese firms sought to ensure supply to the hungry home market by aggressively pursuing joint ventures, especially in developing nations. These relationships, which have frequently proved exploitative of host country labor and marine resources, have often been characterized as a form of neocolonialism. At the same time, with the establishment of its own EEZ, Japan suddenly found itself an oceanic superpower. And I quote here from a Japanese uh, journalistic source. With the coming into effect of the Law of the Sea Convention, Japan has come to administer an offshore area spanning 4.47 million square kilometers, 12 times more than its total land mass, and the sixth largest in the world. Thanks to its possession of scattered Pacific Ocean islands, Japan's total area, land and sea combined, now covers 4.85 million square kilometers, which is among the world's top 10. Among the deep sea areas under Japan's administration are the Japan Trench, Izu Ogosawara Trench, Nankai Trough, and Ryukyu Trench. And in terms of cubic volume, Japan's EEZ is estimated to be the fourth largest in the world. And so it seems, in an age of the creeping territorialization of the world's oceans, Japan's once grandiose vision of a pelagic empire may yet be realized. Thank you. I was instructed by the organizer that uh, we need to leave a lot of time for interactive um, a forum, and I was not disciplined enough to, to get them <laughs> shorten their talk, so I'll be, I'll be brief to save time. Um, I'll just go from um, uh, Ding Zuzui first, and then go the uh, uh, opposite direction. Um, Ding Zuzui's paper uh, showed us that uh, it, I'm, I'm already sold, and he already uh, explored charter new territory, new waters, <laughs> new waters, and uh, that to show us the the the, the Japanese uh, pelagic empire uh, that was uh, no less than impressive, and uh, that legacy um, also lead to a new rising mar maritime power. Um, and uh, I would like to add that this paper also show us that um, uh, historically, at least, that the traditional maritime industry was uh, extremely important that no longer receive as much attention as we need as the, our attention is shift on resources like oil and minerals. And so um, uh, Ding Tsuzui's paper really show us uh, the, the power uh, of the traditional industry uh, of its time. And, um, my question uh, is, um, is that uh, now uh, because of the, uh, the uh, fishery is in serious decline and it's going to be replaced by a new need uh, for the new resources, oil and mineral. So it seemed that this new reorientation, new or orientation is going to push, um, encourage Japan to be more assertive than ever, uh, especially given its legacy. Um, so that's, that's what I'm wondering if you can comment on that. And then we have, um, Professor uh, Moscolini's uh, paper on this historical role uh, between China uh, between Philippines and China, Vienna, that uh, uh, frizzle out. Uh, you know, I, I read a very long, detailed, and informative paper um, about about this uh, particular incident and try to draw some um, lessons uh, from history and uh, shed some light about how the current uh, uh, intense diplomatic uh, competition and. and uh, <coughs> small military roles uh, may resolve. Um, and uh, Professor Mascolini uh, uh, insightfully point out that uh, 
uh, time has changed. You know, at that time, uh, China was um, uh, up till 90s, you know, still exporting resources, rec exporting oil, and China was has, suffering from a lot of internal instability. And, and I, I'd like to add, uh, there was a time that uh, when Philippines was trying to explore um, the, the resources on, uh, on and around the Reed Bank in 1976, um, China, Mao just died. And we have a major political turmoil that, that China was not in a position to look much elsewhere. Um, and Deng Xiaoping, for uh, uh, all his wisdom, claimed that he did not have the wisdom to resolve these problems. And all the ocean uh, maritime dispute, uh, he preferred to shelf it and to focus on China's economic um, development and modernization. And so, uh, and uh, I would like to add uh, also, I think a new, uh, the, the new uh, uh, environment China have today compared to in the 1970s that um, China has much more political clout. China in 1972 uh, replace, oh not replace, enter UN and then 1979 replace um, Taiwan to be the uh, permanent member of the Security Council. Um, and also today I think China with its rise and also feel uh, the kind of a new uh, U.S. containment policy um, that encircling China and at least some policymakers express um, this such concerns and they see that United States um, is having a close ally with South Korea, Japan, uh, Philippines, Australia, um, and in, uh, and close getting closer tie with India. Um, so those concerns were not um, expressive back in that old days. And I think the need for an open water that is South China Sea, you know, the, the, the East China Sea is very problematic to say the least. And so maybe they have a greater incentive to maintain um, that open access to sea um, uh, in, in, in addition to all what you've claimed. So um, you, you uh, in the end, um, uh, try to uh, show some optimism, like the, you know, because the, these um, uh, leaders of these states eventually resort to negotiation, and they understand the limits um, and danger of those of those uh, assertiveness. Um, and I wonder, because time has changed, and then new conditions. Um, as a matter of fact, it show us less optimism, um, and. Uh, um, in, in South China Sea. And um, um, Professor uh, Dutton's paper shows the changing concept of high seas and territorial waters um, and, and direct us from the, uh, the, the tension uh, of territorial uh, or the ocean, uh, maritime claim from above water to, to below water and also bring another dimension of historical memories that are still registered in, in these in these dispute. And um, uh, you you mentioned that the you know the the, the there are different kind of mem history and different kind of memory um, that's that's uh, play a role in Japan. And I wonder, I just want to play on this theme of memory, um, that Japan uh, not only has a dispute with, with China over the um, Sengkezu or, or Diaoyi Island, but also uh, island with uh, dispute with Korea. And uh, what's the name of, of the Korea? Um, Dokdo and uh, Takashima Island, um, and uh, and uh, North Territories, or in Russia it's called the South Kirling Island with, with Russia, and that also has historical uh, dimension to it. You know, Dean uh, 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 Tsutsui also already showed that uh, Japan's Palak Empire uh, was uh, was creating tension with Russia as well. Um, so I wonder if uh, 
if you see any parallel usage of history and memory um, in the claim and uh, under or, or the understanding of of these dispute uh, between Japan and other country. So, anybody wants? Well, thank you, Ling. Let me just say a couple things on the points uh, that you raised. I think it is interesting this observation, uh, the way in which the strategic resources have changed, but in many ways the debates have stayed uh, the same. That you know, fish were terribly important uh, economically uh, prior to World War II, uh, but now we're looking at sort of the mineral resources of the area. Uh, and there are other ways we could look at this as well. You know, I'm not an expert, uh, uh, but there has been a lot of work done on uh, undersea cables uh, prior to World War II uh, as generating the very same kind of tensions, uh, which now uh, the very placeness of mineral resources uh, under the seas uh, do. Uh, and I think one of the good things about this now coming to the fore for us as historians is it allows us to build back uh, and sort of fill in uh, those gaps and make sense out of what might seem like a new phenomenon, uh, but really has been with us uh, for a very, as Alexis told us so beautifully, uh, a very long time. Well, um Thank you, uh, Professor Xiao, for your comments, and I really appreciate the uh, additional variables that you suggested that I could incorporate into this rather preliminary set of conclusions that I have tried to tease out of a sort of narrative history of disputes over this one particular shoal. Um, I think that you're right that even though you know, there is sort of reason to be guardedly optimistic. Uh, changing circumstances in the present have made that optimism that much difficult, that much more difficult to maintain. But on the other hand, I think that still it's really striking, or at least what struck me is that the way in which the sort of highest level leadership stresses status quo and peaceful resolution of disputes. And now, I suppose one strand that I could have drawn out more and should have drawn out more is how that high-level policy diverges from events as they develop on the ground, right? So it's very unlikely that leaders in Beijing are telling these maritime surveillance forces in the South China Sea to go out and cause trouble with Philippine oil exploration rigs, right? So there are multiple actors, even within China, right, that are each pursuing their own motives, and that's something that is an extremely, extremely risky factor when we're talking about how these things develop. And the other issue is public opinion. The Philippines' public is not at all happy about the prospect of cooperative development of oil resources. They're really, 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 really mad about it. And I'm sure people within China, or at least some people within China, are not too thrilled about it either. And so that's another variable that comes in. So I think that when I'm talking about this sort of reasons for guarded optimism, I'm talking more about the highest levels of leadership and the most sort of influential people at the top, but there are all these other factors that are going on within society and also on the ground that make things much more complicated. So I really appreciate your points. Thanks. Um, I think that, thank you for your question. Memory is an incredibly slippery slope. I mean, I can't remember what I had for dinner last Friday night. So uh, as a historian, I stick, I stick with law and what people write down. and. Um, I think what's important to remember, and I'm so glad that that Dean Sitsui, that <laughs> Dean Sitsui um, put all those great maps up of a pre-1945 pelagic empire. Until 1994, Japan was enormously opposed to EEZ regimes. And a shift happened with the development of the continental shelf provisions. This is best measured for me in 2007 with the passage of the basic maritime law in Japan and the creation of a new cabinet level ministerial position in Japan to coordinate what had been eight separate bureaus, et cetera, et cetera, and a host of different organizations into one structure, one office. Um, this office is also in charge of the Coast Guard, which is not an incidental aspect to these disputes. Um, 
But I think what's important to think about, and I'm very glad you raised all the other disputes, because uh, for decades, back to that sort of closed door, backroom dealing, state to state, one on one, they were managed in the sense that they were kept off the streets. They were, you know, the. 1965 normalization agreement between Japan and South Korea, for example, 600 appendix pages concern fishery delineation mm -hmm. lines. I mean, there's a treaty, and then there's where to fish. Mm -hmm. But they were negotiating. These were constantly updated. But what's happened now in this new redefining of, I'm calling it a maritime nation, but I'm probably mm -hmm. going to have to go all tzatzui with a new pelagic <laughs> empire, um, is that the problem is the way this is structured, if Japan gives an inch on one of the disputes, it risks losing another and them all. And so that very important map that we've each ended with of Japan as the world's sixth largest nation is premised on full sovereign, no dispute control of each of these territories. Now, the most important one to that map is actually Okino Torishima, which we didn't talk about today, and that's the one that you pour cement on to keep it above the waterline, <laughs> which law still requires. Um, but this is a very significant shift. Um, I think, you know, until 1945, Japan was a maritime empire. What happened with the loss, and forgive me because I'm still working on this, but what happened with the collapse of the empire in 1945 is that a consciousness shift occurred that, yes, Japan was still a maritime place. It is an island, after all. But social studies textbooks, for example, shifted to rice farming and urban life as the definitional features of being Japanese. And there's a brilliant historian who just died of Japan, Amino Yoshihiko, who notices this is a really significant disjunct. You know, here we are living on an island, but we're pretending for agrarian fundamentalist reasons that we are all rice all the time. I think that's shifted again since 2000, and we're back out into the ocean. And the, the key now is bringing Japanese society along with this.